Good morning, church family. Uh, we want to thank you for for joining uh, with us at Mount Zion Miracle Station. Uh, we want to welcome all the participants. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a verse in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where it says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But certainly, um, uh, if your mindset was like mine, when you uh, read of that verse, you, you may have thought that uh, gathered together meant that we were in the same room, in the same building, uh, in the same location. But um, this pandemic has taught us differently, that we can gather together over the internet. And uh, though we are in different locations, we are still of the same mindset that we've come to worship God and that we are uh, gathering with an expectation that um, we are going to uh, have in our midst the Holy Spirit. Um, it, it is somehow incredible how God can, can, can be over these, the, 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 the internet and, and be able to uh, inspire and encourage and um, uplift even though we're in different locations. And so we want to, we want to uh, welcome you as was flashed on our screen and Billy could bring that back up to our men's day uh, celebration um, here at Mount Zion Miracle Station. The first Sabbath in December is our men's day. Uh, and though we uh, are not able to gather together in the traditional sense, we want to welcome you to our celebration of um, the Lord's Day. And uh, we have um, um, a dynamic speaker that uh, we uh, have the expectation that God is going to use in a mighty way. And though it is Men's Day, uh, we want you to know that uh, we, we welcome all of God's family to worship with us. And, and so uh, we are so thankful that um, you're able to be with us and we are looking forward to what God is going to do uh, through the speaker, through the musical selections from mutual agreement and um, from what he is going to bless us with this day. So I don't know if there are uh, any announcements from uh, Allegheny East Conference, no. and if so, uh, if we could bring those up at this time. Um, Elder, we don't have any uh, welcome from the conference today, but I would like to introduce, um, at least give an introduction of our special music. And then right before um, our speaker, I'll introduce our speaker as well, uh, even though he, does, he doesn't need introduction to most, but just in case. Um, so our special music is from Mutual Agreement. In the fall of 1993, six young men formed an a cappella group uh, sextet called Mutual Agreement, which means a covenant with God. Their intention is to spread the word of God through song, bringing hope, strength, and encouragement to all who listen. Each member brings his own individual gifts, talents, and creativity to the group. The group uses the human voice as the chief instrument of their performance. Each member mutually agrees that their music ministry will not be kept confined within the traditional walls of the church. Their mission field consists of ministering to the sick and shut in, incarcerated youth and adults, hospitals, evangelistic meetings, and wherever there is a need to provide encouragement through song. Mutual Agreement has ministered in various parts of the country and performed with national recording artists such as Daryl Coley, Wintley Phipps, Sounds of Blackness, CeCe Winans, and Hezekiah Walker, just to name a few. They are a, member, they are a member of the Gospel Music Workshop of America and have appeared on Showtime at the Apollo and the Breath of Life telecast. Mutual Agreement has also performed at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC, and was awarded for their participation in the celebration of Black history 
uh, at the U.S. Department of State by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Mutual, mutual agreement was nominated for one of the eight be uh, one of the eight best a cappella vocal bands or groups in the Mid-Atlantic region of the United States by the Mid-Atlantic Regional Harmony Association. They have been featured on various television and radio programs. And if you have more information on wanting to find uh, recordings and, and creation from them, um, you, can, you can go to djax2 at arlingtonva.us uh, and I'll have contact information for uh, Donald Jackson as well. And so our special music today, uh, our first song, um, you will hear from them uh, coming up is Battlefield. Battlefield, 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 battlefield. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. Him that I, I would serve him till I die, and I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord, and I promise him that I. I would serve him till I die, and I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. I was a lonely idol, and I was a sinner too, and I heard the voice of Jesus saying there is a work to do, well I took the master's hand and I joined the Christian band and I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. Don't you know I am on the battlefield, the battlefield, on the battlefield for my Lord. That I, yes, I promise him that, I that I'd serve him till I die, and that is why on the battlefield, I am on the battlefield, for my Lord, on the battlefield, my take Lord. it a little higher, say it on, on, on the battlefield, the battlefield, on the battlefield for my Lord, on the battlefield, 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 for my Lord. Yes, I am, and I promise that I, yes, I promise that I serve Him till I die, and that is a lie. On the battlefield, on the battlefield, for my Lord, on the battlefield, for my Lord. The going gets around, the going gets tough now, but you got the key. We're on the battlefield, 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 we're on it might be in your home, on the battlefield. but you got to keep We're on, the keep on pressing right on. on the and that is why on the battlefield for my Lord. Lord. I am on, on the battlefield, the battlefield on the battlefield for my Lord. On the battlefield for my heart. Two, three, four, left, right, for Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. We thank uh, 
We thank Mutual Agreement for that music. I know that brought back memories for many of you as you listen to the harmony of them. Um, now we will have our children's story. Hi everyone, it's Aunt Frenita. Today's story is called The Parable of the Great Beast. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 14, verse 15. It says, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Today's message is Jesus invites us to be with him in heaven. Jesus told a story once about someone who had prepared a great feast. When the feast was ready, he sent to call the guest. Find out what happened and what it could mean for us. Once, Jesus and his disciples were having a meal at someone's house, and Jesus told this story. A man gave a big banquet and invited many people, Jesus began. When it was time to eat, the man sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, everything is ready. But all the guests said that they could not come. Each man made an excuse. The first one said, I have just bought a land, and I must go look at it. Please excuse me. Another man said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen. I must go try them. Please excuse me. A third man said, I just got married. I can't come. So the servant returned. He told his master what had happened. Then the master became angry and said, Go at once into the streets and the alleys of the town. Bring in the poor, the cripple, the blind, and the lame. Later the servant said to him, Master, I did what you told me to do, but we still have places for more people. The master said to the servant, Go out into the roads and country lanes. Tell the people there to come. I want my house to be full. None of those men that I invited first will ever eat with me. Jesus was talking about himself in this parable. He is like the man who planned the party and invited many people. Jesus has invited everyone to accept his salvation, which leads to eternal life, and he's giving you an invitation. Many people in the story had excuses for not coming to the party. They let other things become more important than being with their friend. They weren't really true friends at all. Because they were too busy with things, they turned down the invitation and missed the great feast. In this parable, the invitation to the banquet is Jesus' invitation for us to accept his salvation. Accepting salvation means that we ask Jesus to forgive our sins and choose to do the things he wants us to do. We have a choice. We can decide to accept his invitation or to let other things become more important in our lives. How about you? Right now, will you say yes to the invitation Jesus has given you? Do you want to be with him in heaven and experience the joy of being in his presence forever? We thank you for that children's story. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for today. 
Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst is a native of Youngstown, Ohio. Brother Billy Walker, he's a Cleveland Brown fan, unfortunately, but we'll love him anyway. He has been happily married and romantically involved with his wife Janice for 39 wonderful, exciting years. They have two amazing and accomplished adult daughters and one favorite granddaughter. Minister Vanderhorst is co-founder of Prepare Our Youth Incorporated, Prepare Our Youth, um, Prepare Our Youth, a nonprofit organization servicing children, youth, and families through education and counseling based in Washington, D.C. Minister Vanderhorst is an author and publisher. He has written articles on social, cultural, relational, and spiritual concerns. He also has written eight, has written and published eight books. He is currently writing five more. His favorite quote is, hands that help are holier than lips that pray. Have mercy. I've had the privilege of knowing um, Minister Vanderhorst for a number of years. And I just, uh, I thank him for his mentorship, his friendship, um, has been a, 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 the ultimate role model of a black man in the community, uh, speaking what he feels and believing what he and believing what he believes, and always putting in and depositing into young black brothers and sisters. And so it is my pleasure that after you hear the sound, uh, the, the hymn of meditation from Mutual Agreement, that the voice, the next voice you will hear will be that of Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst. Hear ye him. Prepare your hearts. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be.
I'd like to say good morning to my brothers and sisters at Mount Zion Miracle Station. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here to speak to myself as well as to you. And I want to thank my friend, Pastor Jimmy Gibson for this opportunity to share with the brothers on Men's Day. You've got a quality pastor, a pastor with a shepherd's heart. I've known him for quite a number of years and I've seen the transition of his life through the spirit. And I'm just so thankful that um, he has been assigned to you. Um, many of you know that I do have some um, history with Wilmington, Delaware, but um, with your particular um, fellowship, this is my first time, but I thank the Lord for the privilege of being able to um, speak today. The title of the message is a message to the black man, a message to the black man. Master John was the owner of a show dog business and it had won many prizes for him over the years. In fact, it helped him to become wealthy and when the envy of his friends and the dog even helped save the master's life on a number of occasions. But as the vicissitudes of capitalism would have it, there came a time when there was no longer any money in the show dog business. And this situation changed Master John's feelings toward, toward his once prized possession. He could be heard saying, he is a lazy, no good for nothing dog. All he wants to do is just lie around and eat my food. I wish that he'd go away. So filled with hatred and resentment, Master John by various cruel and ingenuous means drove his dog rabidly mad. One day as fate would have it, the mad dog attempted to attack his owner. Master John failed him with a single shot from his elephant gun. But because there was a law against shooting dogs, Master John was tried before a jury of his peers. Master John was represented by his lawyer who pleaded self-defense. He said, it's cut and dried. The dog was mad. And in his madness, he sought to attack his owner, who in self-defense shot him. His driving the dog mad, thus allegedly having precipitated the dog's uh, attack, argue the prosecutor was irrelevant and immaterial. Has not a man a right to self-defense? Besides, he's only a dog prone to a dog's nature to go mad. Had he not been a dog, he would not have been driven mad in the first place. For if his master had not shot him, the dog would have lived to attack one of us, our wives, our elders, our fair haired little children. And what does it matter how he became mad? What does it matter if one dog is no longer disturbing the peace and posing a threat to law and order? Master John did the world a favor. And for that, he should be honored and not prosecuted. The jury of his peers found him not guilty. Thus began the strange career of Master John, whose single-minded purpose in life became of breeding mad dogs and executing them in self-defense. He thereby gained a great reputation and honored status among his neighbors who he protected from mad dogs running loose in the streets. 
He became an expert at breeding, apprehending, and executing mad dogs. His bank account increased, for he was now in a very lucrative business. He caged his trained mad dogs with not so mad dogs, many of them whom themselves became mad and then escaped their confines, threatening the peace. Mad dogs were everywhere. The, the neighbors were in fear and terror. And they even became incapable, get this, of distinguishing the mad dogs from the not so mad dogs. All dogs, even the dogs who were members of the family, even Sambo, the model dog, who everyone thought was near human, aroused their suspicions. Thus, as a preventative measure, the village was lamentably forced to liquidate all dogs, regardless of their social status or mental state. After all, a dog is a dog is a dog. They even formed a society for the eradication of all dogs everywhere. America drives black men mad and then America executes us in a thousand different ways. The African black man soldier in America has been nothing short of traumatic. The venerable Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois encapsulated it best when he said, and I quote, one ever feels his two-ness, an American and a black man. Two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps him from being torn asunder, unquote. For many black males trying to cope with this blatant unabated trauma is like trying to hold balloons underwater, but soon our energy becomes spent and stuff begins to pop up through our personalities and attitudes and temperaments in deleterious and destructive ways. Sooner or later, the drama from trauma oftentimes surfaces in our most meaningful relationships, our marriages, or families, or communities. Dr. Joy DeGruy in her seminal book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, says this, quote, trauma is an injury caused by an outside, usually violent force, event, or experience. We can experience this injury physically, emotionally, psychologically, and or spiritually. Traumas can upset our equilibrium and sense of well-being. If one traumatic experience can result in distorted attitudes, dysfunctional behaviors, and unwanted consequences, this pattern is magnified exponentially when, it, when a person repeatedly experiences severe trauma, and it is much worse when the traumas are caused by human beings, unquote. Although black males experience an array of traumatic experiences, I believe that one of the most disturbing and repeated traumas that we experience is rejection. No matter how uh, we have tried to hide it or the multiplicity of coping mechanisms we depend upon, rejection resonates and resides in our spirit, soul, and body, affecting our spirit health, our mental emotional health, and our physical health and well-being. And these challenges, either uh, many black men are in denial of or have difficulty pinpointing their origin. 
Now, the nature of rejection is not only mind altering, it is life altering. The rejection of the black male in the, the United States and the diaspora is tantamount, get this, to a total and complete disavowal of our humanness. This rejection that we experience on a daily basis virtually nullifies our personhood. We become persona non grata, a non-person. So sometimes I even wonder, how we accomplish and acquire and achieve so much with rejection tethered tether like, a, like a noose around our necks. But equally, I wonder what we could accomplish, acquire, and achieve without this noose of rejection around our necks. I looked up rejection and the original meaning is to throw or to throw back. In psychology, social rejection is an impersonal situation, interpersonal situation that occurs when a person or a group of people deliberately exclude an individual from a social relationship or from social interaction. Rejection is emotionally painful because of the social nature of us as human beings. And we have a basic need to be accepted as a group and in a group. All humans, even introverts, require a certain amount of social acceptance and interaction to be psychologically healthy. And being a member of a group is important for social identity, which is a key or possibly the key to a healthy self-concept. Rejection of an entire group of people can have especially adverse effects, particularly when it results in social dislocation or disenfranchisement. And I don't know one black male who hasn't experienced social rejection. Social rejection, uh, many brothers can recall, uh, uh, can, can start or begin in childhood. We see it and we hear it. It is reinforced in the school systems, be they public, private, or parochial. And once a Black male recognizes this rejection as a social norm, it becomes difficult to navigate without help or hope. Social rejection lurks like hidden landmines. We never know when we will encounter them, but we know when it happens, when we hit one, because we feel it. Be it racial profiling, brutalized by rogue police, being followed in a store, getting slower than normal service in a restaurant, or even by a white woman clutching her purse when, when we walk past her. All these recurring forms of rejection open fresh psychological wounds. And this rejection puts us at greater risk for internalizing issues, yielding low to no esteem, anger and rage, insecurity, and even depression or externalizing behaviors like addictions and self-destructive lifestyles, or disregarding even the sanctity of the lives of others. And sad to say, Brother Ronnie, you have to unmute yourself. Man, we can't hear the most. Okay. Yeah, the volume is low. You can't even hear it. Audio. 
There you go. Okay. You're back. Um, hopefully you heard most of what I was saying. No, we missed it. We missed that last, that last maybe okay. minute. All right. So basically then, um, and, and I'm sorry that I don't know what happened. It's okay. You're good. But um, as we look at this social rejection, um, it begins in childhood for black males. We see it, we hear it. It's reinforced in the school systems, public, private, and parochial. And once a black male recognizes this rejection as a social norm, it becomes difficult to navigate without help or hope. Social rejection lurks like hidden landmines. We, we never know when we'll hit one, but we know when we do because we feel it. Be it racial profiling, brutalized by police, being followed in a store, getting slower than normal service in a restaurant or, or, or by a, a white woman clutching her purse when we walk by. All these recurring forms of rejection open fresh psychological wounds. Rejection puts us at greater risk for internalizing issues, yielding low to no esteem, anger and rage, insecurity, and even depression or externalizing behaviors like addictions and self-destructive lifestyles or disregarding the sanctity of the lives of others. Consequently, we are witnessing an unprecedented increase of some black males who are wreaking havoc on their marriages, families, and communities. And that fact is undeniable as statistics from black therapists exponentially bear witness. And what has been happening to black men is now being perpetrated through some black men. Don't miss this. What's been happening to us is being perpetrated through some of us. Paulo Ferrer in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed posits this not only do the oppressed, he's saying, not only do the oppressed begin to assimilate the ideas of the oppressors, but begin to see the oppressor in one another. That's deep. But, but, but before I go any further, let me address, address those of you who may think that I'm pimping this old tired victim's mentality or making excuses for black men not taking personal responsibility for our own faulty choices and behaviors because we have a free will. And that is true, we have a free will. Dr. Bobby Wright in his book, The Psychopathic Racial Personality even broke this concept down he says, yes, we do have a free will. We are free moral agents. But what he says is not brought into the discussion are the conditions that are created that we must operate our free will within. Hmm. So I'm not making excuses, but the conditions that have been created that we as black men live in has to be part of the conversation. The conditions that were created in the enslavement, in Jim Crow, in reconstruction, in integration, in all of these things. Yes, we have a free will, but what are the conditions that are created? We have to talk about that because if we exclude that from the conversation, then it simply gets down to this, this notion of personal responsibility as if there is no causative. It's like militancy. Militancy is not a cause. It is a response to status quo, to oppression. And we see a lot of responses that impact us as a people. 
I was on a panel and, and I was discussing something, uh, a question they had asked. And I said, uh, I have black rage. I have it. I have it every day. I don't leave home without it. However, the spirit has taught me to have black rage creatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, that's the difference there that I, I become part of the solution and not part of the problems. But there are conditions that have been created that I operate my black rage within. So rejection in all its forms resonates so deeply in a black man's spirit that words even fail to articulate how we really feel. But this, if this is true, that black males are inescapably bound together. And what affects one of us affects all of us. Now that's different with white males because white males collectively are not held responsible to what a white male individually does. Jeffrey Dahmer, eight people, white males are not held accountable for what Jeffrey Dahmer did, but not so with black men. What impacts one of us impacts all of us. There's a broad brush that's swept across us when one black male falls, it's like we all fall. Consider the flagrant hypocritical incendiary attacks on Dr. Jeremiah Wright, who spoke loud and clear to, uh, as he spoke truth to power, but he was met with the fury of hell itself because mainstream America always coalesces to mute the black prophetic voices that call out its sins by any hellish means necessary. Colin Ka Kaepernick became summarily dismissed as persona non grata as the NFL commissioner and the multi-millionaire team owners obviously colluded and effectively condemned Cap to perpetual football exile. And of course, we were re-traumatized for eight minutes and 46 seconds while the knee of a rogue cop, Derek Chauvin, crushed the life out of George Floyd. It spoke loud and clear to black males in this country that no matter what, a brother's life doesn't count half as much as a white man's. It's rejection. And then there is the prison industrial complex that prioritizes penalization over rehabilitation as it pertains to black males. Dr. Naeem Akbar concisely critiqued this travesty travesty. <clears throat> he said, quote, the vast majority of creative black minds in America who are males are locked up in prisons during their most productive years. In the years when most Euro-American males are present in universities, colleges, and training institutes, gaining the skills that are necessary to ensure that they run the world the way they have been running the world. Our future leaders, future educators, future advocates can be found in the jails of America, locked away, unable to think under the daily watchful eye of sick minds who would rather see them dead than learning. And then he ended by saying, those who show the greatest promise of thinking, self-direction, understanding, and comprehension are the least likely to ever get paroled. They are removed not by physical death, but by institutional death. Rejection. So no matter how we cut it, 
this psychological warfare continues since the black man and woman stepped with chained ankles and wrists out of the stinking halls of ships named Jesus and the grace of God and onto the shores of this disunited states. One brother said emancipation is a proclamation, but not a fact. But somehow too many of our people in the church and the village have been kindly conditioned to believe that the black man's plight is all about individual responsibility. So that somehow uh, the church and the village is absolved. Mel Reeves in his book on black violence said many of us have already fallen into the racially rigged trap that makes middle class blacks less inclined to reach out to our less fortunate brothers and sisters who catch some of the same hell we do but have less resources both psychological and material to fight back and resist their demonization history teaches us that you can ignore people you demonize and sometimes you can kill them or allow them to be killed because clearly they deserve their fate. I personally, personally know folk in the church and the village who have succumbed to the demonizing of our own black men. And this is also rejection. The Holy Spirit led me to something that I believe is a solution. It is what I call a principled stabilizing philosophy that we can counter this rejection. I found it. Now, other than our Lord and Savior, I don't think that there is a brother in scripture that understands rejection like David. David is probably the most transparent brother that ever lived. As a man of African descent, David's life and experiences, I believe, encapsulate and encompass the lives of black males. There is nothing that we go through that David didn't go through. Ascending to the summit of sublime spirituality and then descending to the depths of degradation. We know victory and we know failure. We know triumph and we know tears. And David experienced it also. David is the one that gives us a message to the black man. Although David was anointed king of the African Hebrew Israelites, we find this narrative in 1 Samuel 29. And in 1 Samuel 29, we find David hiding. For years, he had been wander, wander, wandering and he was an outlaw because King Saul's schizophrenic personality toward David caused him to take refuge eventually in the land of the Philistines of all people. The Philistines. David had a band of 600 desperate men. And on that day, the Philistines were preparing to attack King Saul and the Israelite army. David had even suggested 
that him and his men accompanied the Philistines into battle against Saul. But quite naturally, the generals of the Philistine soldiers were suspicious of David and they rejected his help and they told the king, don't take David and his men with us. So David and his men parted company and they made the weary trek, a three day march back to their home in Ziklag hoping that they can find rest in their homes and joy in their families. In 1 Samuel 29 and verse 11, it says, so David and his men got up early in the morning and went back to the country of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now we're moving to 1 Samuel 30 and verse 1. As soon as David and his men arrived in Ziklag on the third day, they saw that the Amalekites attacked Ziklag from the south and burned down the city. They took all the women, both young and old, as prisoners. They didn't kill anyone. They only took them as prisoners. When David and his men came and found Ziklag, they saw the city burning. Their wives and sons and daughters were all gone. The Amalekites had taken them as well as their property and cattle. And it is here that we find David probably at his lowest point emotionally. As black men, we can all recount specific experiences and encounters that have brought us to low points. Black men, many of us are entering into depression, even dark places. And I have to be honest with you all. It wasn't long ago that I was in a very dark place. Very dark. And it seems that these low points are, are becoming more frequent with many brothers today. With all the stuff coming at us on a daily basis, it, it doesn't take much to bring brothers down, even though on the exterior, we don't admit it. But inside, where we suppress and repress stuff. So in 1 Samuel 30, in verse 4, it says, they wept until they had no more strength to weep. Their, their families are gone. The city is burned. And now David and his men cried until they had no more strength to cry. But then threats of insurrection began to spread. Even after all that David had done for these men, all that he had done for their families. Now these men rejected David. In fact, the scripture tells us that David's men contemplated stoning him. But here we go. Verse six, the message to the black man. But this is one of the most eloquent conjunctions in all of scripture. But David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. That's the message to the black man from David. On the one hand, all David had left was the clothes on his back. Everything else was gone, carried off 
by the Amalekites while their homes were smoldering, winking embers. David was closer to death at that moment than when he faced, faced the dreaded Goliath. But David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. At that moment, my brothers, David made an intentional, proactive decision to buoy himself up above the rage, ridicule, and rejection. So much so that he could one day write, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. This is the message to the black man in response to all the onslaughts that this society marshals against us. Encourage yourself in the Lord your God. This has to be our stabilizing philosophy of life. In all opposition, despondency, disappointment, racism, misunderstanding, mistreatment, injustice, denial of our personhood and humanness, rejection, and all the physical and mental health problems that we have suffered as a result of these influencing factors. Encourage yourself in the Lord, your God, your Yahweh, your Elohim, the Most High. Instead of wallowing on our pity pots before depression sets in again, before suicidal thoughts become a so-called viable option, my God, we have to encourage ourselves in the Lord. I have three brief considerations, three takeaways, and I'll be finished. Number one, and I got this from, from my mentor, Dr. Miles Monroe. I call him my mentor, you see, uh, there are a lot of mothers in the village who are parenting sons alone. And I have encouraged them and inspired them to make books their mentors, make books, let the books be their son's mentors. Black men who write books to become the mentors of their sons who have no personal mentors. But my mentor, Dr. Ma 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 Dr. Miles Monroe said this, it is easier to say no when you know what your yes is. Woo. Talk about encouraging yourself in the Lord. It is easier to say no when you know what your yes is. Come on, brothers, you got to process that. You've got to cogitate on that. You've got to know your yes, your yeses, so that you can push aside the no's that beckon and seduce and call you and me to self-medicate or to shut down on our wives and family and loved ones before we enter again into those dark spaces and places or even to retaliate. It's easier to say no when you know what your yes is. Number two, Dr. Howard Thurman in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited said this, I, I need your 
listening ear for this, my brothers. He said, life, and I'm quoting, life under oppression provides no excuse for avoiding the path of courageous, creative integrity. My, my, my. Woo. Whoa, my God. I'll say it again. Life under oppression provides no excuse for avoiding the path of courageous, creative integrity. I read something this morning and it said this, time and wear tests metal and proves whether it's solid or plated. You know how some stuff is supposed to be gold plated, but it scratches off. Yeah. Time and tests wear metal and proves whether it's solid or plated. So what I'm saying in essence, my brothers, is that crisis and challenges don't make character, they reveal character. We really get to see what we are and who we are under duress. Courageous, creative, integrity can withstand interrogation and rejection in any form. And David's bleeding heart was staunched because at the extreme moment of his rejection was his conviction that in spite of it all, his personal relationship with the Lord, his God would sustain him through this traumatic ordeal. For these are the times and seasons that will test and try the souls of black men. Yet it is in these times and seasons that you and I see ourselves, whether we have a superficial relationship with the Lord or whether we can truly encourage ourselves in the Lord and continue to handle our business. Counseling brothers who are now discovering that for years they've had a shallow relationship with the Lord because they're losing it. And the cup of their traumatic experiences are spilling over into their relationships. Some of them are stepping out on their wives. Brothers losing it to pornography, losing it to drugs and alcohol, losing it in nefarious behaviors, losing to actions that unnecessarily drain their family finances. And the dramatic and deciding difference between a stagnant and vague acquaintance or a vital, strong personal relationship with the Lord is knowing how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Because we're not going to get it in society. We find little or no encouragement there. Almost everywhere we turn, somebody is negative about, about Black men. Very few people have anything good to say about black males, but David admonishes us to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Because although the Amalekites had stolen his possessions and his family and the, but, uh, and, 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 and the cattle and, and burned down their cities, they had not stolen his God. So David said in verse seven, bring me the ephod. Many of you know what the ephod is. That's what the, the, the high priests wore. 
and it was 12 stones representing uh, the 12 tribes of the African Hebrew Israelites. And, and there was the Urim and the Thummim, uh, one on each side, the Urim, the Thummim, which meant light and right. And, and the, the, the priests would, would, would ask Yahweh, what should we do, uh, would ask for uh, pertinent uh, understanding for decisions. And, and, and then a stone would light up one from each side, which would give an affirmative or a negative answer. That ephod is also equivalent to seeking the word. And when we go to the word on a daily basis, we find wisdom and counsel and instruction and revelation. There's a difference between religious knowledge and revelation knowledge. So David said, bring me the ephod. And he asked Yahweh, should we pursue? And the answer came back, pursue and you shall overcome them. You shall recover all. David and his men, and you can read the rest in your spare time, David and his men went out to fight. They found an Egyptian laying in the field, half dead. He was the servant of one of the Amalekite leaders. And they told him, if you don't tell us where they are, we're going to kill you. He said, I'll tell you if you spare my life. And so they spared his life and they even fed him raisin cakes and so forth. And so his men went on, they were pursuing to recover that which was stolen, to recover that which was lost. It reminds me of my very favorite text in Joel 2.25, and I have personally experienced it. It said, Yahweh said, I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. And David's men were pursuing to recover, to restore. But as they were making their way, 200 of the men got weary and, and they could not cross the brook be sore. So David told them, you all stay there and, and, and stay here with the equipment and, and the rest of us will go on. They were giving up. As some brothers are giving up on their identity and purpose. Daily, we see signs of fatigue engulfing brothers. Though their appearance looks strong and some of them look cut. However, they're getting weak. Brothers are giving up. They can't go on, it seems. So David said, you all stay here. We have brothers who are at the, 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 the basore of prisons, they can't go on. And the basore of addictions and they, they can't go on. David had compassion on his men who were too weary. And we need to be able to see our brothers who are weary, who are languishing in juvenile detention centers and jails and prisons and on street corners and hanging out and in strip clubs and crack houses and even in public schools. And we've got to battle for them because a whole lot of them are weary now. So he says, you all stay here and we'll go. And they found the Amalekites. And the scripture says that they fought not only that whole day, but also unto the evening of the next day. They fought. And they recovered everything. They, they got their wives and their children and their cattle. They got everything back. Because David encouraged himself in the Lord. And he sought the face of Yahweh. That's number three. 
he sought the face of Yahweh and he received his instructions and they recovered it all. And my brothers, it is possible for us. It is possible for us to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. It is possible for us to mend our relationships, our significant relationships, or at least if you are not with your children's mother, at least be her friend and do right by your children. It is possible to restore and recover as we seek the face of Yahweh. I end here. Pearl Kleeg wrote something very powerful in her book. She said, this time, turn the ships around. They said when the ships pulled on the shores of Africa and the slavers came ashore to look for us, that women were the ones who held them back, the ones who told the men that it might be too dangerous to go down to the water's edge. Women were the ones, they say, who encouraged them to stay home, telling them how worried they would be if they went down there with the warriors to turn the ships around, assuring them that if they just stayed by the fire with them, the white folks would change their minds and go away all by themselves. They say that's the reason why they didn't turn the ships around because they thought women didn't want them to. Assuming this is a correct presentation of historical fact, is clearly one of the greatest examples of miscommunication in all human her story and one that we should avoid repeating at all costs. So let it be known that we are looking for a brother who will turn the ships around, a brother who will go into the crack house and turn the ships around a brother who will go into places where it is open season on our children and turn the ships around, a brother who will hear the screams of sisters beaten to death by a man who says he loves them and turn the ships around, a brother who will hear the whimper of babies and turn uh, who who babies with AIDS and turn the ships around a brother who, who will see people sleeping on the streets and turn the ships around, a brother who will gather with the warriors and march down to the edge of the sea and turn the ships around, turn the ships around, turn the ships around, and this time, turn the ships around. This is the message to the black man. Let us pray. Our Father, even though this is men's day and I did not focus on black women, they are experiencing what we are and much more. For even though we as black men and women have struggled together, black men still don't have the history of oppression that black women have experienced and continue to experience this very day. 
But today, we are going to encourage ourselves in you. We are going to, 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 through your power and also through needed professional intervention, be restored in our spirit, soul, and body so we can come into relationships as we should in our marriages, family, and community. So even though things are sailing around us, even though rejection is par for the course, Today and going forward, I commit and I pray that these men will commit that each day we will open your word and encourage ourselves in you. And before we come into the presence of our families, we will come out of your presence so that we can be the men the husbands, the fathers, the community leaders that you have so committed us. In your names, we pray, amen. Where there is life, there is hope and hands that help are holier than lips that pray. Minister Vanderhorst, I just have to say, man, this is a heavy, profound message that that is salient to uh, the needs and necessities of us as brothers and sisters in the diaspora and within the community and within the kingdom of God. And I make the appeal that if there's someone that's listening via Facebook and or that has joined us that that would just like to get together and pray, get together and learn how to how to do these things that 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 the man of God has laid out for us. Um, you can always inbox us, you know, this new virtual way you can inbox us. You can, you can, you can go to uh, the website, our church website, www.miraclestationsda.org, go on our Facebook page, wherever it is to connect with some other brothers and sisters that are, are, are seeking Yahweh's face, not his favor but his face. And so, Minister, I just, my heart is full that many of us are dealing with this rejection and that we have PTSD, if you will, from this rejection. And we encourage you and we affirm you that you keep preaching, you keep teaching, and you keep yearning for the souls of us black brothers and sisters in the community. And as a community, we have to, we have to do better. When we know better, it's incumbent that we do better, whether in the church or out the church, all of us are still in the community. And so I encourage anyone that uh, this is an appeal I'm not asking you to join Mount Zion Miracle Station. I'm asking you to get connected to someone or something or organization, church or wherever that will lead you to the face of Yahweh, that will lead you to the face of God, that we will get to the point that we can encourage ourselves. That term, uh, Elder Vanderhorst is 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 in Psalm forty two and forty three, verses five and eleven and forty two and verse five and forty three, where it says, "Why should I be downcast? Should I have hope and have encouraged myself in dry spaces and dry places 
when we can't hear God, when we can't see God, when we can't find God, when we can't feel God, sometimes God is telling us, encourage yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Vanderhorst, for that powerful message. And that's a message that will resonate for, for days, months, and years to come. And so I would like to lead us into our, our first elder as we do on, as our custom here on Mount Zion, we go into prayer and testimonies. And your testimony may be the fact that this message today affected and infected you in a positive and, and, and meaningful way. So Elder Walker, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we go through our prayer and testimonies uh, as we transition to the next segment. Thank you, Pastor. And I want to thank uh, Elder Vanderhorst for such a powerful message and certainly one that uh, has resonated with my experience and I'm sure with the experience of many black men. Um, as always, we encourage you to share your, your prayer request and your testimony. Um, we serve a prayer answering God and we know that he is still in the prayer answering business. As many may be, may have been made aware of our, my older sister, many had tested positive for COVID-19. She's in the hospital, she's being treated, but the word is that she is doing well and they expect a successful recovery. And so thank you for your prayers. Are there any other prayer requests or testimonies? If you would simply unmute yourself if you're on Zoom and pastor, if you could pass on any prayer request that is, that is brought up on Facebook. Will do. Hello. Yes. This is Sister Joy. Um, first of all, I wanna give honor and praise to God for the work that he's doing in my life and um, just keep me in prayer that I stay focused on this journey that he has for me and that I do his will. Thank you. Amen. Sister Elizabeth has an unspoken request. Uh, Sister Stevens asked for prayer for her health. I, this is Sister Wise. I, I have a testimony. Um, I've been asking the uh, ladies to pray for um, my son, Henry, who has uh, been in school He um, for HVAC. And he there was times he got really discouraged and wanted to give up. And I kept telling him, keep going. It, it'll be worth it. And yesterday when he came home, he showed me that he has uh, passed and he is now certified uh, to be um, an HVAC technician. And I told him it was a rough journey, but, but you did it. So I just thank everyone for praying for him and just praising God for this right now. And um, also I would like to continue to pray for Mount Zion. Uh, all of the family members, I love everybody and that we just continue to be strong and encouraging in the Lord. Amen. Good testimony. Anyone else? There are no others on Facebook at the moment. Then let us pray. Most kind and ever loving Father, we again, Lord, want to thank you for the blessing of this day. We thank you for the message from your manservant. We thank you, Lord, for the encouragement to encourage ourselves in the Lord when we reach those dry places. We ask, Lord, that you would continually allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and mind, to lead, guide, and direct us in our everyday living. Help us, Lord, to be receptive to how your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and minds. We pray, Lord, 
for the black community. We pray for the social injustice that needs to come to an end. That in a nation that you have, have brought into existence that espouses equality for all men and women, that you will bring about a realization of that in our lifetime. We ask Lord that you would remember all of the prayer requests that have gone up throughout this week's noonday prayer. We ask that you remember the bereaved families, those that have lost loved ones, whether to the COVID-19 virus or for whatever the malady or illness was. Comfort them, Lord, as only you know how. We pray, Lord, for those that are infected with the virus that you'll continue to give the doctors and nurses the skills they need in order to minister to them to restore their health. Mm. We are thankful, Lord, that that COVID-19 virus is not the death sentence that it was earlier. We ask, Lord, that you would bless every household that is represented on this Zoom conference or Facebook page. That they've come to you this day looking for encouragement and looking for the blessings in their lives that you know we stand in need of. We pray for Sister Joy Sanders that you will continue to bless and keep her Help her to stay focused on her journey with you. We ask that you would move according to your will on all of the unspoken prayer requests. We pray for all of the sick and shut in, not just those, Lord, that are infected with some illness, but we pray for those that are incarcerated. We know that jails have become even more dangerous now in this COVID-19 period than before. We ask that you remember Sister Stevens and bless her health. And Lord, we pray for all of your houses of faith, but we as specifically for Mount Zion Miracle Station. We thank you for conference leadership. And we are trusting, Lord, that you are going to move them to the point where we will once again be able to reassemble ourselves in your house. We are looking forward to the day when we can praise your holy name in your house. We ask, Lord, that you would be with every man, every black man and black man's family, with the community. You know the issues we face. You know the injustices that are, per that are perpetrated on us on a daily basis. We were trusting, Lord, that you have placed your head to protection round about those that have called on your holy name. Help us, Lord, to renew that right kind of relationship with you. So even in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of our troubles, that you will deliver us. We're trusting, Lord, that you will do this. We ask that you would lead us in, as Mount Zion as how you would have us to continue our mission of sharing this gospel with those that need to know it. 
and in this giving season. Help each of us, Lord, to be encouraged to look around us and see who it is that we can help lift up. As you have blessed us, help us to be willing to share that blessing with others. We pray especially for our community service ministry that we will be able to provide that food basket to that family that's in need. We thank you for how you continue to provide the resources we need in order to share with others. And we ask that you would just continue, Lord, to bless us and keep us as we seek to do your will. Now help us, Lord, to be mindful that this is your Sabbath day. Help us to keep it holy. And we again thank you, Lord, for the speaker of the hour, for the message to the black men that he shared. Help us to not just rejoice in it, but help us to apply it to our everyday living. Help us, Lord, to take our rightful place in our families and in our community. Help us to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Continue to Allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and minds and help us to study your word daily so that we can know you for ourselves. Now bless and keep us throughout this day. Help us to keep it holy. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, just a few quick announcements as we close out. Um, I would like to share a couple of this out there. Um, as uh, Minister Vanderhorst had mentioned, reading is reading is a wonderful thing. Uh, there's a book out there, Overcoming the Man Laws, uh, written by Oliver Marcel, who's out of the Maryland area. Mm -hmm. A fantastic book. I haven't started reading it yet, but I have seen the reviews on it. And I've talked to Brother Marcel as well. Uh, this is a fabulous book for you to get into your library. Um, and then I will be posting more uh, book resources on our website, uh, www.miraclestationsda.org. And then also, uh, Minister Vanderhorst is a part of this team here uh, with Dr. Myron Edmonds, pastor in Cleveland, Ohio, Five Ways Men Can Win. And if you go to his website, myronedmonds.com, you will see, um, you will be able to, there's a, a variety of things that you can get, but one of the things that's on there that he's been pushing for us to get is our, our, our wellness, our self-wellness kit on how to take care of ourselves. Many of us don't know how to take care of ourselves and our mental health, our, 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 our emotional health. And so these things, um, and until... And I think he mentioned it, and this is a, 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 a line that I use, put your mask on first before you try to tell right. everybody else on how to put their mask on. This is an opportunity for us to, as black men to put our mask on so that we'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise to be able to contribute to our communities. So see Myron Edmonds uh, website again, uh, www.myronedmonds.com. And then also get the book by Oliver Marcel, um, The Overcoming the Man Laws. Next week, we will have um, Education Day. Our guest speaker will be Mr. Albert e., the Superintendent of Schools of Allegheny East Conference. He will be bringing us the word, and we will have a few things of our young people spotlighting the students um, that we have at Mount Zion that are at Sharon Temple Adventist School. We have an opportunity for someone from the Sharon Temple Adventist School to, to make mention of what's going on, the great things that are going on at Sharon Temple. Yeah. Uh, and those of you that are looking for schools for your uh, edu uh, Christian education in the Wilmington area, uh, yeah. that have the opportunity while we are virtual to be able to transfer your children to Sharon Temple Adventist School and so that we will look to try to have you there. Um, also today we do have AYS. It will be virtual. Um, 
It is starting at 4 p.m., not the new, not the usual 4.30. So if you have any young people that you would like to have engaged in AY, we will have our virtual AY program today at 4 p.m. We thank you all for joining us. I think on the third weekend this year, of this month as well, we're going to do a Christmas musical program. So we pray that all of you will be able, those of you that have joined us for the first time and that may be scrolling and looking uh, for different ser services. I know that's, that's an opportunity now that you go through. Now that you've been on for the first time, don't be a stranger. You are now an official uh, um, honorary member of the Mount Zion Miracle Station Church. And so we welcome you to join us at any time. I don't believe in sheep stealing. I do believe in borrowing them from time to time. And so we look forward to worshiping with you again. Uh, Minister Vanderhorst, if you are still there, man, God bless you. We pray. Uh, we're praying for you and with you and your family. My brother, I love you like, like, like a fat kid love cake. And you know, I'm a fat kid that loves cake. Uh, amen. And um, I, I thank I thank Sister Janice for allowing the opportunity to to use you for a, about an hour or so of time. Uh, we pray for all of the the the, the, the your family and um, tell Brother Steve I haven't seen him in a long time. Tell Steve I said hello. I miss his face in the place and the smile in the aisle and his feet under the seat. Thank you. So we um we are we're thankful for your for 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 really all for all you do. And you know, we go back like 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 we cry like recliners and eight tracks, and I just love you. I love your ministry. Um one additional thing that I forgot, our women's our Bay Area women's ministry. I don't have the slide prepared, but we start tomorrow night. Tomorrow night um, at 7, uh, 7 p.m., I believe, Sister Ruli, is that? 7.30, 7.30. 7.30, starting tomorrow night, the Bay Area Women's Ministry will be uh, participating in a 10 days of fasting and praying. And so there will be some dynamic women that will be preaching from uh, and speaking and giving devotional thoughts um, our devotional thoughts, I believe, are uh, that will be online specifically will be uh, December 6th, 7th, and 8th, and then also uh, December 11th through the 15th. And so those particular days, they will be online. And the other days, um, they will be, you are in individual prayer, uh, that you will be praying individually off the line, just still praying and fasting. And we thank uh, Sister Ruley and the entire Bay Area Women's Ministry team for their consistent prayers for the area and for the churches. We know that the, uh, the prayers of a righteous man and woman avail as much. And so we thank you so much, Sister Ruley, and your women's ministry team. Um, we also, um, we are looking forward to having um, uh, end of the year program as well. So keep your ears and eyes open for that. Um, and if you have any ideas you want to give to the church or anything, you can just give us a call at any time. And if you have any concerns or you need prayer, our, 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 our church is, uh, even though the building is closed, church is never closed. You are the church living. Those that wherever your seat is, that's where the church is. And so you are a part of, and you are a major integral part of the church. So let us have benediction, offer benediction for this service, uh, but not on our life. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for what you have shown us, given us, and allowed us to hear and experience today. Lord, that message was specifically for black men, but everybody can understand rejection. And so God, we ask that we apply it to our lives that will help us to grow us and to allow us to be better from it. That Lord, once we know better, we'll do better. Lord, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness and Lord bless us again until we meet at the next appointed time. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to go out with Battlefield. Battlefield, 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 Battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my 
Sabbath.